perfect. I thought as the storm released sheets of rain over the canopy that spilled onto the walkway. Lightning lit up the sky in a brilliant stitch of fire, followed by a powerful bellow. I was leaning against one of the tapered columns, with my shoulder bag anchored over my shoulder. My ride, who swore to me he'd be back after the show, still hadn't returned from his drink run. No phone call, no message. He was probably passed out at home drunk as a sailor. A very stupid sailor. As undependable as he was, and as much as I wanted to wring his neck right now, I couldn't help but thank him for setting the gig up for me in the first place. If not for the last minute recommendation, Godfrey would have found another disc jockey for his house party. It wasn't a huge gig, but any extra penny helps. But where did that leave me now? Stranded in a rainstorm with a house filled with grad students too high or drunk to find their own feet, let alone hold a coherent conversation. No soul here was fit to give me a lift, and like hell, I'd stay the night in this place. I cautiously peeked at the time of my phone. 1.25 a.m. Together now. Perfect. Sorry about that little lady, Godfrey said, floundering out of the doorway. He was wearing a dark plum Willy Wonka-ass coat. I got your pay right here. Thanks for the show. You really got a knack for this, huh? Sam, wasn't it? You got it. Thanks for booking me. I said, collecting the money and also catching a sweetly better whiff of the burnt herbal scent drifting off of him. It's my pleasure. He grinned at me and then he whistled at the flooded walkway. Man, it's really coming down tonight. Are you still waiting for your ride? Yeah, hopefully they'll be here soon. Well, just let me know if you could use a ride. Hell, you could even stay here if you wanted. Tempting as the offer was, the suggestive look that carried it made the offer almost laughable. The sort of way a butcher ogles a salted slab of meat. No thanks, I'm good. I buckled my lips into a dismissive smile. Suit yourself then. He said and he sauntered back inside where there was warmth. I returned to rain watching. Anybody that I could call would be asleep by now. Well, almost everyone. No, I shook the thought immediately. Even if my father did decide to help, his teeth would sink into me so deep he'd taste some marrow. What were you thinking, Sam? No backup plans? No plan B? Why'd I always have to save you from yourself? Sure, that's just what I needed to do. And in the perfect I told you so scenario, so we could massage that irritating father bravado. After my mom had fell into a coma, he sort of did too in his own way. Only waking up to be a father when it was convenient for him. Bitter thoughts encrusted with raw irritation brushed against my skull at the mere idea. No thanks, that's not going to happen. I whispered to the precipitation ghost. Come to think of it, this house wasn't too far from the station on 23rd Street half a block or so. The subway could save me the expenses of calling an Uber. No doubt it was more of a pain in the ass. But a pain in the ass meant less money out of my pocket. And I'd also have to get a ride back here to pick up my music equipment. What was a little wetness anyway? I slipped a headphone into my ear, pulled my folding umbrella from my shoulder bag, unfurled it and walked through the swelling puddles. The rain pelted my face with a cold mist. I was tired. And Fat Lady Misery was beginning to hum a few bars. But I still had the music in my ear, and that was all that I needed to get by. It wasn't the money that solely drove me here. It was mostly the passion. Once that first track starts, my heart disappears. Regrets, money troubles, memories. Nothing else matters but the music. There isn't any other feeling in this world like the rush of energy followed by a crowd's euphoric screams as they flail their arms like mental patients. My mind feels like a blowpipe shaping molten glass bubbles into something different. Something new. Sometimes I even forget to breathe. It's so easy to lose yourself in the harmonic flow vibrating your organs. It didn't take long for me to reach the gleaming wet intersection of 5th Avenue and Broadway. I crossed the relatively quiet street to reach the northbound entrance to the terminal. 
Two lampposts were cast in a brilliant glare, with green tops and milky white bottoms. A homeless man was curled over a thin sheet of cardboard at the foot of the stairs, taking shelter from the storm. I maneuvered my heavy bag to the shoulder farthest from him. If the man tried anything, he'd get a lovely taste full of mace stowed in my pocket. Lucky for him, though, he only shifted sleeping positions as I passed by and I continued down the hallway. I bought a ticket from one of the machines, slipped it into the turnstile gate, and I found more stairs. They led me to the boarding area next to the track. The air was permeated with that familiar damp, guttery, metallic funk. When I was nine, I used to call them train farts. And there was a woman here, too. She was aimlessly walking between the columns, cradling a baby in her arms as she did so. It was sort of an odd look given the time and place. She was wearing an ivory white puffer jacket with a fur trimmed hood. But soon enough, a quiet gliding hum sounded from the tunnel. Out came the piercing spotlights, followed by the high pitched electronic whine that reverberated off the walls as the train rolled to a stop. The platform screen doors slid open and were joined by a pre recorded, strangely melodic voice. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. And there was a note of challenge in the warning, as though the voice was daring you to do the opposite. I wandered inside and I sat down in one of the powdery blue bucket seats. The woman followed after me and took a seat only a few rows in front of me. Our sodium lights gave her skin a yellow cast, suggestive of severe jaundice. I leaned back and I blew a warm burst of air over my fingers. It was a home stretch now, and the worst part of the night was far behind me. Please stand clear of the closing doors. And the robotic voice chimed again as the doors simultaneously slipped shut. And the gliding hum returned, and the underground train pulled forward with a jerk. And within minutes, the music in my ear was replaced by a painful, crackling hiss. And I pulled out the earbud and popped in the second one. It worked fine for a minute before succumbing to the same static screech. Come on, come on. I moaned, so much for the anesthetic. Some rain probably slipped through my hair and I ruined them. From my peripheral, I noticed the woman suddenly stand up from her chair and wander down the aisle. She was walking with a suspicious slowness. When she was parallel to me, she reseated herself. And my eyes instinctively dropped to my phone to avoid an uncomfortable staring contest with a stranger. I then looked up and realized that the woman wasn't taking her eyes off of me. From this close, I could see the unhealthy pastiness of her skin and the jauntiness of her features. Her black hair was short, only reaching her gaunt cheeks. Her eyes were green and looked to be struggling to stay open. And there was no whiteness in them, only red nets of pop blood vessels surrounding abnormally enlarged pupils. It almost looked like cat eye syndrome, an eye condition that I had read about on the internet once. And when she noticed that I was now returning the look, her tight lips parkered into a humorless smile. I'm sorry, but can I help you with something? I asked. And the woman's hourglass shaped pupils perked at my question. I'm glad you're here, really. The poor thing wasn't going to last much longer. Her voice was dull with fatigue. Not going to last much longer. Just as I stood up to find a different seat, the woman leaned forward and whispered to the infant in her lap. A few incoherent muffles slipped out. The strange woman then sat up straight and brushed away the covering from her child's face. But it wasn't a child I saw. It was far from it. Its uneven skull resembled a skinless grape, with clusters of forked veins branching throughout its thin skin. Its mouth, if you could even call it that, was a lipless slit. The circumference of its pale head was taken up by two eyeless sockets, draped on the inside with lines of stringy tissue. I was left standing there stunned and attempting to fathom exactly what I was looking at. At that moment, bands of its straggly eye material tightened up like a bald fist in both of its sockets. A terrible pulsating pain suddenly condensed in the center of my head, and my ears started to ring. The throbbing tightness of my skull increased to the point where I collapsed back into the seat. It felt as though somebody was hammering an invisible stake in my brain like a vampire heart. I couldn't move, 
My arms and legs felt like mud. I couldn't scream. Stand up, just stand up. I begged my muscles. The warped mass of a head remained motionless, save for its aisles full of clenching meat threads. More of the strands twitched and convulsed into tight knots, working in tandem with the pain, the vivid, paralyzing pain. The arc sodium lights were unsteadily flickering. I was forced to watch as transparent flaps unfurled from both sides of the thing's head. They folded into strange spiral shapes. Another clump of skin in the center of its face protruded outwards. The clump molded into some sort of limpid nose, and that was when I realized that those folds on its head were supposed to be ears. Not only that, was the thing bigger now? It had to be. The woman confirmed this as she lifted the entity from her lap and gently placed it on the seat next to her. It was the size of a small toddler now. Its boneless looking limbs hung like shriveled up chicken legs. Thin worm like threads wriggled out of its broad scalp that soon became wet clots of black hair. Its limbs started to thrash about as though they were being shocked by short electric bursts. I could hear the muffled sounds of joints grinding together and popping out of place repeatedly. They were even stretching and growing longer. Even its skin was changing into a healthier, fleshier color, like a chameleon manipulating its own skin cells. The invisible stake pushed further into my cluster of nerves behind my eyes. I thought I was bleeding, but it was only hot tears rolling down my cheeks. I would have given anything in the world for the pain to stop. Little by little, change by change, the bean was beginning to take on the physical semblance of a young girl. A few forked black veins still lingered behind its fake pigmented skin. There was a vertical scar below its belly button, the same scar that I had. But that made no sense. My scar was from an ovarian cyst surgery when I was 12. Why would it have the same scar? And then I saw the birthmark on its right shoulder. My birthmark. I realized that it wasn't an invisible stake being plunged into my skull. It was a straw. This thing, whatever in God's name it was, was sucking up my memories, sampling the different flavors, and it was enjoying them. What is going to happen? I wondered. What is going to happen when there are two of me? I know it hurts. The woman said with a perceptive nod. That disembodied stare on her face made my stomach churn. I'm sorry for this. Really, I am. But such things are necessary for us. They are necessary for our survival. You see? The humanoid thing was now a naked living picture of me. Except for the straggly jungles in its eye sockets. It stood upon its bare, trembling legs. And took an indecisive step forward. I wanted to scream. But all that came out was a raspy whimpering. An abrupt female recording then sounded over the intercom. Next station, 14th Street. That was it. The next station. If just one soul were waiting on that platform, they'd see me. They'd see the woman with the fucked up eyes. And they'd see the naked humanoid standing in front of me. The naked, unpolished version of myself continued towards me. Two fingers on its left hand split open. Slender, filament-like stalks bloomed out of them and squirmed as though tasting the air. The dark windows soon became lit canvases of the platform. One person, just one. I begged the cosmos. But a glance through the window told me that nobody was there. Every second that passed was another chunk chipping off of my freedom. The doppelganger bent over and extended its hand, with the dancing filaments towards my face. Eyes! I screamed internally. It wants my eyes. It counterfeited everything else. But why not the eyes? Maybe the woman's pupils were the result of them trying. The high-pitched whistling came, and the train suddenly stopped abruptly. The stop in motion jerked the doppelganger off balance yet again. For a moment, only a moment, the pressurized stabbing pain had dissipated. It had lost its unseen grip on my mind just as the subway door slipped open. Without hesitation, I rooted my fingers into my back pocket. The eyeless version of me turned its gaze back towards me. And just as the kaleidoscope of pain started to bud, the maze canister was already in my hand. A fine aerosol spray of burning chemicals drenched the thing's face, 
and this caused it to let out a horrific, unearthly shriek. The woman from her seat started to scream as well, spitting out random gibberish as though her tongue were stuck to the roof of her mouth. She suddenly jetted from her seat and rushed me. I emptied another burst into her exposed face, which made her writhe away in a shrieking fin. The fat membranes of yellow froth emptied out of the doppelganger's stringy sockets and oozed down its cheeks. A horrific smell of ethanol, insect repellent, and raw sewage struck my nostrils. That horrible piercing shrill was like a broken siren. I gripped the body over my shoulder bag and I lifted it over my head. Without even thinking, I bashed it over the thing's skull, but the noise still persisted, louder than ever. I rushed past the subway doors and I ran like hell up the stairs. The screams of the woman and the thing wearing my face reverberated off the walls. Even as I reached the street again, I could still hear them. The rain still hasn't let up. I hid under a closed restaurant's canopy. This was no doubt 14th Street, but my mind was racing too fast to recognize anything. Unconsciously, my fingers were already curled up around my phone and dialing. My dad picked up the phone. I told him everything in a panicked mess. He told me to stay where I was and he was coming to get me. Who was going to believe me after this? Probably nobody. Not the police, not my family, not my friends. No one. Maybe Godfrey had slipped something into my drink before I left. Maybe I had caught the second hand of something during the show. What I witnessed on that subway felt so unreal. It had to have been in my imagination. Surely they'd have cameras down there, right? I sucked in a deep breath and I tried to control my throbbing chest. While I huddled beneath the canopy, waiting for someone to come and find me, there was something crossing the street towards me. It looked like a woman with a baby in her arms.